Hello again everyone and welcome back to the underground. Today I thought we'd do something a little bit different and talk about our new short form Intel reports which we are calling The Wire and some of the things you might want to think about if you're trying to replicate our system and create something that is more helpful for you in your local area. So right up front, uh, the Wire Intel reports that we're pushing out, these are written mostly by me, and it's basically just a very short form Intel report. Now again, this is nothing special, this is nothing new, it's just something that we're, we're trying out and, and experimenting a bit with. So on the end user side of things, what you guys are going to see is just a short report. It's just a couple of paragraphs here and there of daily events that might be interesting for you, as well as some comments that uh, I add in at the end. As of right now, the reports are going out on basically all of the platforms that we have up. Uh, so you're going to see them being posted pretty much you know, everywhere that we have access to, right? The main platform that you guys are probably going to see these reports on is Telegram. Uh, of course, not an ideal platform by any means. However, it was the easiest one for us to set up and kind of experiment with, with you know, the public out there. So. Uh, that is kind of the main platform that we're working on right now. However, we do want to expand this eventually to obviously like email newsletters or text messages or other different ways of getting these reports uh, however users want to consume them. The idea behind these reports is very simple. It is a quick and dirty, very efficient way of getting out bits of information and intelligence that might be operationally useful. It's not meant to be a roll-up, uh, although we would probably want to incorporate these into like a weekly roll-up at some point, uh, which we're kind of experimenting with right now. Really, it's just meant to be a quick and dirty notification. Hey, something's going on, and here's what we think about it. It's a lot faster than pushing out PowerPoint slides. It's a lot faster than pushing out a YouTube video. But most importantly, the format of a text-only report allows us to send it via some very unique ways. So let's take a look at how we have things set up right now. Even though you guys are seeing these reports being pushed out via Telegram, I thought the most interesting part of this is how they actually get there. So let's take a quick peek under the hood. These reports are generally written by me using WinLink. I draft the uh, report itself in WinLink using a predetermined template based on what kind of message uh, I, I wanna send out. And then I send that report back to a base station who receives it. Now, right now we're currently using VHF and UHF to kind of experiment with the speed of message traffic specifically. Uh, the modem that we're using is VARA, VARA FM for VHF UHF and VARA HF for, you know, obviously the HF transmissions, for those of you who are curious about that part. But anyway, the message gets sent as a simple WinLink peer-to-peer -peer message from one laptop to another. Now the base station receives that message, and since that base station is connected to an internet access point, it can then, using some scripts we've written, push that report, push that email out, uh, in a report format to other platforms as needed. As of right now, again, just Telegram. So that's really it. There's nothing major to it. It's pretty simple as you can see. However, this is a good jumping off point for other things in the future. If we can nail down this Intel report format, get used to people seeing the format, and experiment a little bit more, we can start plugging these kinds of informational uh, products out there to various platforms. So let me address some of the questions that we've got since we've started uh, experimenting with this kind of Intel report format because it's the Intel report itself, the, you know, the wire reports, they're kind of immaterial. It doesn't really matter. It's the system that we're working on behind the scenes that you guys don't really see about just yet. That's the important part. So one of the main questions we've got is, well, since you're using radio to send these reports in the first place, will these reports be sent by radio as well, in addition to the internet-based options? The answer to that is absolutely. At some point, we're going to make that happen. Right now, we're still kind of working out the logistics of how to make that happen, uh, because right now it's kind of a... It's kind of a hard thing to get around, and of course the, the ham community is, is all about rule following, right? So it's kind of hard to sidestep regulations, but we're trying to figure out ways of getting these reports out in such a way that they're beneficial via radio only. Right now, the biggest value that we can have with these kinds of reports and sending things in a non-standard way like this is to encourage people to understand that this is kind of important, right? Ensuring resilience in your communications platforms is very, very important. 
One of the main problems with ham radio as a whole right now is not just the cultural stuff that we've talked about in the past, but also the, I don't want to say lack of content, but there's not really a lot of motivation for the average non-ham user to get on ham radio. I can sit here and talk till I'm blue in the face about how important radio is. However, on the other hand, it's just not enough of a justification for people to spend thousands of dollars sometimes on radio systems for them to buy the radio, buy the laptop, buy the software, buy the licenses, and then go get licensed themselves uh, via a, a government agency, right? It's not enough for them to go through all of that process, then to just sit at home and you know listen to people talk about topics that aren't really relevant, right? It's really hard, despite how I think that that's enough of a justification, it's enough of a justification for me to spend thousands of dollars on radio equipment to be able to talk in an emergency and be able to communicate in an emergency. However, when it comes to daily use, there's just not enough daily use content out there to warrant people getting on ham radio or getting interested in business band radio. Checking into a weekly net for emergency preparedness is not enough of a justification. So, products like this can help justify that cost. If people know that they can get our intel reports via HF radio, even if it's just receive only, that is a good enough justification for a lot of people to go out and spend $30 on an SDR dongle, right? And, you know, 10, 20 bucks on an antenna. That's enough of a justification, I think, for a lot of people if they know that this kind of content's out there. And this is, of course, just the beginning. So when it comes to the question of will this be on radio? Yes. Eventually, yes but we're still trying to figure out how to make that happen. For right now, the biggest use of these reports is that it's a standard format. The header and footer information, which we'll talk about in just a second, is useful for forwarding these messages through any number of means. So if some ham out there wanted to grab our report from Telegram or any other platform and then send it to their buddy via WinLink uh, you know, around the world, they're able to do that because they have the report already written. It's up to the end users to distribute it to their local networks rather than us being a central uh, central point for all of these reports, right? We want to allow people to more easily send and receive information. Another question we get is, what's the value here? Why go through all of this process if you can just post this stuff to Telegram, if you can just post these reports to any you know, website? Obviously, we're using the internet right now to receive the reports and then post them, so why not just stick with the internet? Well, the answer to that is a little bit complicated, right? But there is a lot of value in being able to send information, to have a standardized report, to have standardized frequencies, and to basically create templates for the whole process of sending information from an austere environment back to a headquarters. A lot of the time, I myself am literally sitting in the middle of the woods outside of cell phone reception, outside of internet access whatsoever, and I can still send these reports back to civilization where it gets, you know, then synthesized and pushed out uh, to a variety of platforms. Obviously, the weak link is the internet connection, right? However, Remember how we've talked quite a bit before about being able to flip the switch, right? Being able to more easily operate in a radio-only environment if you had to. Right now, people just aren't going to do it, right? There's a, a, not a whole lot of motivation for people to tune in daily to a specific radio frequency to get information reports. Some people might do it, and there's probably a lot more interest out there than you know we realize. But at the moment, if we're talking about establishing strategic communications, what most people are going to do is download Telegram to their smartphone and get the reports that way. If we can offer a little bit of a reward, a little bit of a motivation to say, hey, in case Telegram goes down, in case the internet goes down entirely, all we have to do is turn the dial on our radio, switch modes, and now we're operating completely autonomously. So hopefully this kind of system is a way to bridge the gap between the ham radio community, the MCOM community, and the internet-based options that are out there. It's very hard to bridge those gaps a lot of times, right? To make the transition seamless. But hopefully this method can do that. 
for a lot of people, if I say, hey, look, uh, Telegram's down, uh, so we're going to go to plan B, you know, we're going to go to the alternate line in our PACE plan, and that alternate plan is an HF radio frequency. So we're going to jump from Telegram to HF radio. If I were to say that, people are just not going to make the jump. It's a lot harder to jump from a smartphone app to an HF radio frequency, right, to receive information. So hopefully something like this will allow people to understand that we're able to bridge the gap and we're able to make this transition a lot easier in the event that we had to. In a perfect world, we would have software written and established in such a way that connections are automatically made, right? So that if the internet is available for users, that's good, we'll use that. But if the internet access goes down or more, more likely it gets censored, we're able to transition seamlessly over to HF radio with absolutely no effort required on the part of the end user. But again, we're kind of a long way out from that. Another question that we get specifically about the reports themselves are what about sources, right? So to answer that, I think I'll take a break for a moment and switch gears to talking about the wire report specifically as it stands right now uh, and kind of go over the format and answer some of the questions that have been surrounding that specific report. Now, of course, this is a developing thing. We're still in development. We're still experimenting. So you might find that by the time this video goes out, we've changed the format slightly. But for right now, this is kind of how things are. So to kind of go down the report, we first have the header information. Now, a lot of this is just pure gibberish to those of you out there who are not familiar with government-style Intel reports. And that's okay. The, the header information is really meant to help the message make it through various uh, communications platforms, right? It's easier to write software that can recognize certain words and numbers and, and formats. So we have right up front the priority. And as you can see in the, in the subject line, the very first line of the report, as it's as it's read on telegram or some of our other platforms it starts with RR that means the message is routine we're trying to use standardized message precedence just like normal uh, Intel reports uh, for us that's just a lot easier because we're familiar with the format and we figured it would be a standardized format that is pretty easy to use the abbreviation for a routine message is RR and as we can see it's spelled out below as well now the DTG the date time group is the format for the date and time the report was sent out or the time the report is generated for. The first four digits are the time of day, the next two digits are the date, and the letter uh, at the end of that is the time zone. It's a little weird uh, getting used to date time groups in, in, in a standard military format. Are, it takes some time to get used to, but it's easier for machines and computers and software to process, so that's why we're going with it. ICOD, ICOD, the information cut off date. That is the time of day and the date that the information uh, kind of stops at. Basically, we have to have a time of day where we stop consuming intelligence and we stop processing information and we actually write the report. So basically, if an event happens after the ICOD uh, time or date, it's not going to be in the report. That's all that means. Then of course controls, as of right now, it says public release because that's the sort of, I guess, for lack of a better term, classification that we're working with. But we also want to allow the automatic forwarding of messages to other groups or to other levels, right? A lot of times people don't want strategic message traffic, but they may need tactical messages on the ground, which this format will, will help with. Then up next we have uh, four characters, four cues in a row. That doesn't mean anything at all. It's just a way of processing the header information. So our software can be trained, it can be programmed to look for four cues in a row to let it know that the header is complete. Up next we have the bluff, the bottom line up front, basically the summary of the entire report if you want it. And up next we have the tear line. Now tear lines are not just a super cool way of making the report look all tactical, they actually have a very useful purpose. And that purpose is to divide up the message into basically the meat of the matter versus all of the other material, right? So if you had to hand this message to someone who doesn't necessarily need to know where it came from, or all of the information that's contained in the header, sometimes which may be sensitive information. Uh, you can tear the report or you can cut it with a pair of scissors if you were to print it out and give them just the meat of the report. They don't need to know anything else. 
So after the tear line, we have the actual report itself, and at the very end, we have the end of the tear line. Again, another thing that can be clipped off, cut and pasted, or physically cut with a pair of scissors uh, if you wanted to, to disseminate the report. And then finally, we have the footer of the message, which includes the analyst who wrote it, just a, a code or name or initials or something helpful to, to determine who wrote a specific report, uh, and then derived from multiple sources. That's just a kind of a holdover that's a, an old habit uh, from those who have are familiar with uh, traditional uh, Intel reports. But I think we'll probably end up taking that out because it's just a waste of characters. It doesn't really help us any. Uh, and then we have the words end report to let people know that that's the, the end of the report. And then four ends also, again, to let software know that that is the final uh, last characters of the message. So for those of you who are curious about how the messages are laid out, that's what we're going with right now. Of course, again, the, this format may change. Now to answer the original question before I got off on a tangent, uh, sources. Sources are hard to put in these because I'm limited by character count. We are limited, at least for Telegram, as to how many characters we can use. So if I were to drop a link or just a series of links, that's going to eat up most of the message traffic, right? So these reports, again, are not roll-ups. This is not a final Intel report. This is a quick and dirty report from the field that requires a little bit of effort on the receiving end to make sense of it. Again, I understand that some people's need for sources is more desperate than the need for oxygen. So at some point, uh, I'm going to put together a roll-up product that will encompass all of, you know, a synthesized version of these, for lack of a better term, tactical intel reports, reports sent from the field under adverse conditions most of the time, and put all those reports together and put together a product that will actually be able to list the sources that we used to write these reports. But we're still working on that format, so that might be a, a few more weeks out. All in all, this is just a very simple way forward. It's not the final end product, and it's not anything particularly special. But it does allow us to start thinking about shifting between the internet-based methods of communication and the radio world. Again, it's very, very hard to bridge the gap between the two. But hopefully this keeps us moving in the right direction and allows us to be a lot more resilient in the event that an internet connection is lost. In theory, we could have the base station for this, this whole system be thousands of miles away. It could be in another nation. All it would take on the receiving end is for someone to receive the scripts we've written, uh, have a knowledge of the frequencies we're using and the call signs we're using, and we could literally send these reports from thousands of miles away to a reliable internet connection, and then they can make it out to the rest of the world. Ordinarily, this could be done even more easily with WinLink's normal systems, right? WinLink itself has a lot of this built in. So what we're kind of doing right now is not really the proper way you'd want to do it, I guess. Uh, but the biggest vulnerability with WinLink, in, in my mind, is the fact that if you use the Telnet options, there is the potential for someone who doesn't like your message to not let that message go through. I understand why WinLink wanted to do this. WinLink wanted to make it so that it's resilient for regional internet outages, so that someone could do exactly like what we want to do, right? Send an email to another station outside of the affected area, which can then forward that message traffic on. However, in today's world, we really want to limit how often we use someone else's server. So I get it if people want to use WinLink like that. However, for me, I want to use WinLink in peer-to-peer -peer mode only. I want to talk from one computer to another computer using one radio to another. That's all I want. I don't want my message traffic going unencrypted over someone else's server. To me, that's just, that's just not a resilient long-term way of doing things. So if we have to kind of reinvent the wheel and kind of use WinLink in a non-standard role, then that's kind of the way it's got to be, at least for now. I can, of course, talk at great length of all of the, of the communications dreams that I myself have and all of the things that I, I eventually want to do. But this is a great way of getting started 
having a somewhat resilient system that allows us to have a common format and a common understanding, most importantly, of the different ways that this information can be sent and received. As the old saying goes, you go to war with the army that you have, not the army that you want. The same idea applies to communications. When a disaster strikes, you have to use the communications that you actually have, the procedures you actually have, and not the things that you want to dream about having one day. So in an emergency, even a somewhat slipshod, badly put together communications plan is better than no communications plan at all. But apart from the communications plan itself, what is also required is a greater understanding of how all of this works. Trust me, I understand. Communications, radio stuff, it is not the easiest thing to learn. My brain just does not work that way. So I understand, probably more than most, a lot of those frustrations that are out there regarding how hard this stuff is to learn, how expensive it is to get into, and also the somewhat unhelpful nature of the culture surrounding ham radio sometimes. I, I get it. Thankfully, that's changing. There are a lot of very good informational sources out there that make this easier than ever before to get into. And with the kind of realization, I guess, that GMRS and commercial radio are options that don't require getting involved in the ham radio world, you know, kind of at all, that brings a lot more options to the table. But like I said, I can sing the praises of radio all day long, but if it's not practical for the average person to use daily, it's just not something that's going to take off and become wildly popular. That's what we're trying to do with these reports and the other products we have coming down the pipeline. Trying to help people justify the effort and the expense of getting into radio either via just listening or building actual communications networks for their local area. We want to make it easier for people to have a reason to prioritize stuff like this. Because the censorship that we've seen over the past few years is just not enough of a justification for most people. It should be, but it's just not. And that's mostly for the reasons I've highlighted before, the barriers to entry, right? So I understand that. So we'll carry on and try to help bridge the gap and provide reasons for people to be on radio, uh, even though right now we're still working on how to make the radio-only networks work uh, from our end. For right now, I'm afraid we're going to have to just rely on Telegram and other internet-based options. But hopefully, for those of you who already have your established communications networks, who already have your local comms set up, and, you, and you're trying to, to increase your capabilities and increase the services you provide, you can use these reports that we're putting out in your own local networks. But as always, much more work to be done. So hopefully that's been helpful for all of you out there, and hopefully that kind of sheds light on some of the reports that we've been putting out lately. And I myself am pretty excited on the stuff we're working on right now to not just provide more resilient information and intelligence sharing, but also to allow all of you to replicate what we have done and improve the resiliency of your own communications networks if you wanted to. So that's all I've got for now. Hopefully this has been helpful in answering some of your questions and kind of shedding light on the, the mentality that we have moving forward with communications. There's much more to come on this. I've got good grief at least six more comms kind of episodes that we're working on right now uh, that are more instructional uh, in nature. But out of all the stuff that we do, those are usually the ones that take the longest to, to actually uh, write and set up and, and configure and all that kind of stuff. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get some of those out pretty soon. And as this project grows, as we start providing a lot more resources for you guys who want to be able to replicate what we're doing, we'll have a lot more deep dives on stuff like this in the future. So that's all I've got for now. Thank you again for watching. Thanks again for all of your support, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.